Hello, 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 hello. Once again, everybody, welcome to your Wednesday night webinar. I am Dr. Patrick McGrath, Chief Clinical Officer at NoCD. Happy to have all of you here tonight. And as always, tonight's just advice, right? I'm not your therapist. Well, maybe, maybe I am. Maybe you're watching. I can't acknowledge that. That would be a total therapy violation. But uh, if you are one of my peeps, thanks for being here. And if you're not, thanks for being here too. We're brought to you by NoCD. NoCD, a downloadable app you can get through Google Play or iOS. Check us out at nocd.com as well. And if you're looking for teletherapy for OCD or related disorders like Oh, trichotillomania or excoriation or tics or maybe even hoarding. We've got that going. And we also do our no CD 411 sessions as well, too. So if you know someone not quite ready for primetime therapy who's looking to get a little bit of info on OCD or all those other things I talked about, like uh, body focused repetitive behaviors or hoarding, we'd be happy to work with you on that as well, too. So welcome, welcome. And uh, Vegan Knowledge JJ says, can't wait to listen in. Just found your channel. Welcome for uh, the first time. Let's all give Vegan Knowledge JJ a, a huge round of applause. Hey, congratulations. Welcome to us. And uh, you'll find that this is not only fun just for hopefully me chatting at all of you, but I think half the time people don't even listen to me and they're all chatting with each other, which is great. Go, go for it. Support each other. Love to see it. Love to see all the support out there in the world. So that is awesome. All right, let's see. Uh, Christian says, hello, I have OCD to say in a short way, can my wife's mother harm me with curses or witchcraft every day? I have thoughts that she can manipulate or harm me with the occult. You know, I've, I've, uh, oh, you, you have another part of there too. It says one part of your brain tells me that can't be real, but some strange things happened that, that, uh, seem to have shocked you. Um, you know, I've had people wish for so many things to happen to me that have not yet. Uh, I've had people wish for my plane to go down when I go to conferences. I've got a card in my wallet that says, I hope my parents die tonight, please God, and has a 666 on it that's been in my wallet now for probably 17 years. Hi, mom and dad, if you're listening, they do listen to this once in a while. So hello, parents, know that I've wished your death. I uh, just want you to all, both of you to be aware of that. Um, and they are still alive. Uh, and uh, so w when they die, I don't know, maybe they will now cut me out of the will because I have uh, put this card in my wallet. So maybe they will believe their death is my fault. But I'm thinking probably not that that I uh, am, am pretty safe in assuming that they're not going to believe that, that card has anything to do with it or else they would have been yelling at me every time I see them to take that card out of my wallet because it's, it, it is there. <clears throat> so uh, OCD does love to pick up on these ideas, though, to tell you that, well, what if, and this could be, and what if it were true, it, maybe it could happen, and maybe you should check it out, or maybe you should do something about it, and and all of that kind of stuff, but we really have no no proof of it whatsoever, right? There's there's no evidence that's just standing out that telling us that, yes, that is. But as you know, OCD needs no evidence whatsoever. OCD only needs two words, and those two words are what if, followed by any kind of worst case scenario that we can possibly experience. So remember that, everybody. OCD loves a what if, and that's, that's what it wants. Um, now, you may say, Ah, but there's been a few odd or strange things that have happened. And guess what? Everybody out there in the world who is listening, who isn't concerned about the occult or, or any of these types of things could also say, ah, but there's been some odd or strange things that have happened to me. We could attribute those to absolutely anything that we might want to attribute them to, right? Some will say it was due to ghostly apparitions. Others will say it's to a higher power. Others will say it's to some kind of demonic thing. And others will say, you know what? As Forrest Gump once said, shit it happens, right? <laughs> and so uh, it all depends on your perspective and how you look at it, because that is just the way that it is. And, and I'm not here to say which one is right or wrong or better than the other one. I just want you to recognize that just because you believe it's true doesn't mean that it necessarily is, because there's plenty of other people out there in the world who do not hold on to that belief whatsoever or follow that kind of logic that you might hold on to. Riley says, my compulsions never feel correct. You always find that when you complete a check or a compulsion, OCD says, but what if, are you sure, do it again? 
OCD says rituals will be there forever if you don't do it. Yes, that is exactly what OCD would say. And so you want advice on how to stop redoing or continuing rituals when they don't feel right. Riley, the entire goal of any therapy when we're utilizing exposure and response prevention therapy is to learn how to not feel right. OCD is always going to tell you that it doesn't feel right. I have never met anyone in the world who has obsessive compulsive disorder, who's done enough rituals to the point where they've said, you know what? I finally did enough rituals. And then my OCD said, oh, congratulations. You've now gotten everything right. See you later. I'm going away. It's been a slice. We'll talk to you soon. It doesn't work that way. That's just not the way that it goes. So if your goal, Riley, is to do this until it feels just right, you can't. And the reason you can't, well, OCD's nickname, it's the doubting disorder. The doubting disorder doubts everything that you do. So no matter how well you do it, it will doubt it. And therefore, it cannot accept that anything that you did was just right. And therefore, you can never do anything just right for OCD because OCD will never accept that anything was done just right because, again, it is the doubting disorder, right? So how can you give a certain answer to something that doubts everything? Now, if any of you can figure that out, you let me know and write that in the comments. And then if you do figure it out, great. We're going to write a book together and we're going to make gazillions of dollars because we have finally found the way to convince OCD to believe something is true. I haven't met a person been able to do that as of yet, though. So it is not about convincing OCD that everything you've done is right and true and everything's OK. That is not our goal. It's just not. Our goal is to be able to say, you know what? That doesn't feel very comfortable. All right. Well, I'm going to have to handle that. I'm going to have to live with that. I'm going to have to learn that I can deal with that. And when I do that, then I can move forward. Until then, I am a hamster just spinning on a wheel in a cage because I am trying to get somewhere. I can see my goal but I'm stuck on this wheel and I'm just spinning and spinning and spinning. I can't move forward whatsoever because I'm stuck on this wheel and I'm spinning. So wait it is. So Riley, the goal is to learn how to handle feeling not right. That's the goal. And when you accept that, I think you'll start to be better. Lewis says, finally started to see symptoms not be as intense or last as long from accepting and allowing. Awesome. You still get terrified when you're suddenly experiencing uh, so, and every DPD, oh, depersonalization, derealization, and everything seems suddenly distant. Any tips? Lewis, you're going to follow the same thing for that, just like you have everything else. Uh, just because you feel those things doesn't mean that they're dangerous in any way whatsoever. And I'm thinking you're probably doing what a lot of anxious people do. I'll be interested to see in what anyone says in the comments on this. I'm going to I'm going to make a statement here and I I would love to see some feedback on it. I'm a believer that people who have a lot of anxiety live an almost lifestyle. And you may say, what is an almost lifestyle? So I'm going to tell you what an almost lifestyle is. An almost lifestyle is a lifestyle that says Ooh, that almost happened. So close, so close. It almost happened. So I better do all sorts of things to make sure that it doesn't ever happen again. And when you do those things, right, when you live in that almost lifestyle, you think, hmm, only by either sheer luck or grace or whatever it might be, did I get through that. Or maybe it's because I did compulsions. And that was the only reason that I got through it. So if I want to continue to get through all of these things more and more and more, you know what I need to do? I need to do more compulsions. That's what I need to do. Because if I don't, the bad thing will actually occur. So this almost lifestyle is common in these types of statements. I almost died. I almost threw up. I almost passed out. I almost had a panic attack. I almost lost it. I almost blew my stack. I almost lost my mind. I almost blah, blah, blah. 
add your statement there, right? And that is all the almosts. But guess what? That applies to everybody. Okay. If I'm driving tonight after this webinar and somebody cuts my off, me off, I could say, I almost got into an accident. So does that mean that since I almost got into an accident that I should never drive again because it almost happened? And wouldn't it be better just not to drive at all so that I would never have that kind of experience ever happen? Or should I continue to drive? What do you think? So I'll be interested just to hear what everybody thinks and um, see what you think about the almost lifestyle experience. Jay says, why does sexual orientation OCD feel so real? You're straight and you've always been straight. You've been dealing with it since you were in your teens. You're now married and love your wife. Do I have to leave her just because of this? Why doesn't OCD understand logic? Even when I know the truth and know the answer, it still questions, doubts that, and understand that this is ego dystonic. How do I live with OCD being that it is chaotic? And what's the difference between sexual orientation, OCD, and denial with the struggle with that that you have? Um, so. A lot of, lot of stuff to unpack there. I think we dealt with some of that already in the previous question where we talked about the idea that, yes, this is ego dystonic and OCD isn't going to be cured by logic because if it is, I would just give a lecture to all of you. In fact, here, let, let's try it. Everyone with OCD, please put down your phone in a nice spot for a second. Take your hands off the keyboards. And I want you all to listen to me. I'm going to give you logic right now. Here we go, everyone. Your OCD is a liar and not telling you the truth. Stop believing in it. There we go. All right. You're all cured now. Everything's great. Thank you all for listening to the webinar. It's been a slice to get to know all of you. Uh, in fact, I'll never have to do therapy again now with anybody because I have given you logic. And you are now all cured of all OCD because you have had logic. Congratulations, everyone. I wish it worked that way right? And it doesn't matter where that logic comes from, if it's from me or other people that you love or respect or anything like that, that's just not the way that it works, right? It's not a logical problem. It's an emotional problem, okay? This is an emotional issue. If logic could change minds, well, we would just lecture you. You got to go out and you got to do behaviors and you got to sit with discomfort and you got to live with discomfort. And you got to learn that you can handle those things. That's what has to happen, right? All of those things are the things that have to happen. Now, Jay, you talk about, again, why does it feel so real? And if anybody's ever listened to my webinars, you know where I'm going with this because I talk about this almost every single week. It feels real because it has to feel real. Because if it didn't feel real, then you wouldn't need a therapist and you wouldn't need therapy. And you could just be like, oh, I had this intrusive thought, but it really doesn't bother me. So uh, I don't really need to talk to you, actually. Thanks for uh, letting me call you, but everything's good. All's fine. And I'm just going to move on and take care of myself. Wouldn't it be great if we could just do that? I mean, believe me, I would love to not have this job in, in, I believe me, I love my job, but I would love to not have it because it would mean no one was bothered by obsessive compulsive disorder anymore. I hope to be able to come to work one day and, and be hearing this. There are no more patients because we've cured OCD. It's gone, right? Well, well, awesome. I mean, I, I got to figure out another way to make some money now, but you know, whatever, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. I'm, I will happily do that, actually, if the case is that we have cured obsessive compulsive disorder. I don't know when that's going to happen. I don't see it happening uh, in the next few days. So I'm going to continue coming into work every day and I'm going to continue doing what I do, which is help people fight obsessive compulsive disorder. But fight might not be the best word to say there. Live with obsessive compulsive disorder is actually a better phrase. Um, so, Jay, it has to feel real. Otherwise, you don't need me or a therapist or this webinar or anything like that. And you you say, do you need to leave 
your your wife because of this i i would absolutely steadfastly say no otherwise we would have to tell everybody with ocd that they have to stop doing something that they love or that is a big part of their life that ocd has grabbed onto we would say to everyone with scrupulosity then stop going to church or believing in a higher power we would say to everyone with pedophilic OCD, you can never be around any children ever again for the rest of your life. We would say to everyone uh, who, who's had a baby, you know what, you should probably be away from your child just in case you have some kind of intrusive thoughts about them. Those would be the then the types of advice that we would give to people. But I, I think we would all agree that would be awful, horrible advice to give to anyone. We wouldn't want anyone to actually follow through on that kind of advice or believe that advice. It would be absolutely awful and terrible, right? So uh, I, I hope that that kind of goes through for everybody here. And I want everyone to really recognize that, um, you know, I want you to behave yourself through OCD. I want you to learn that you can handle doing anything, anything that you want to do, even if OCD tells you there's no way that you could do it, right? Uh, just looking at some of the comments coming through on that, I like what Beth says, OCD is never satisfied ever. And I, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more, right? It, it is never actually satisfied. So the goal is not to try to satisfy OCD because you're never going to do that. The goal is to learn that you're going to live with OCD and that you can handle living a life that has obsessive compulsive disorder uh, along for the ride, right? Just like you could live a life that has physical things going along for the ride as well too. All right, let's go back up. Scroll, 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 scroll. There we go. Okay, uh, let's go to Tad Man. I recently discovered that you have relationship OCD. When, by the way, uh, before I get into that, Tad Man, um, yours truly was just featured in Men's Health magazine in a article about relationship OCD. Uh, I, I, I had no auspices in my life of ever being in men's health because I am in no way the model uh, workout dude that uh, you would see on the cover of that. But guess what? Mental health and physical health, both important. And I got in for the mental health side. So, you know, take that, all of you who picked on me for being a wimpy kid. Ha <laughs> ha, I made it into Men's Health Magazine. All right, no, I, I digress. I'm sorry. All right, I'll go back to this. All right, so Tadman says, I recently discovered that I have relationship OCD. Whenever my girlfriend and I talk about getting married, I struggle with the thought of knowing that I could marry the wrong person. I know that marriage is not going to magically fix your OCD as it will most likely intensify it. However, I feel like me waiting it out may be a compulsion in order to feel just right. Uh, I would go along with that, Tad Man. So um, obviously, anytime anybody's going to get married, there's always going to be doubts and questions. I don't believe anyone who says, I had no doubts about it whatsoever. Uh, I don't trust them. I think everyone has doubts about every major decision from buying a house to buying a car to getting married to, uh, you know, picking a college or a university or a major, you know, all these kinds of things. There's always going to be doubts. Our, our brain naturally throws out doubts at us and worst case scenarios and those types of things. It's just the way that it is. Now, relationship OCD takes that, of course, on steroids, right? And starts comparing. Oh, well, they, they seem to hold hands more than we do. I wonder if that means that they love each other more than us. And, and, oh, wow. Um, you know, they, they tell each other they love each other every time they get off the phone. And we only do that about 78% of the time that we get off the phone. Uh, are we supposed to be together? Is this right? So again, going back to OCD being the doubting disorder, and if relationships that you're in are important to you, well, OCD loves to pick on the things that are important to you. Therefore, it will pick on the relationships that you're in. And what does that mean? you're going to potentially have to deal with relationship-based obsessive compulsive disorder where you're going to have intrusive thoughts or images or urges about your relationship. And then what are you going to do? 
you're going to try to do some kind of mental act or behavioral act as a compulsion to get assurances that everything is fine and dandy and great and wonderful in your relationship, but it will never quite be enough. And you know what happens when things are never quite enough? The obsessions cycle back and then we do more compulsions and we try again to be enough. Oh, and it didn't quite work. And then the obsession cycles back and we go through the compulsions and that still wasn't quite enough. So we do it again and we do it again and we do it again. And we never get to the point of feeling like, yep, finally, I've achieved it. That's what I've been looking for. That's what I've been wanting. I have finally found that Nirvana experience now more than ever. Guess what? I have achieved exactly what I want. I know 100% certain without a doubt that this is the right relationship for me. There is no doubt about this relationship whatsoever. The two of us are soulmates and are meant to be together and we will be forever and there will be nothing that will ever tear us apart whatsoever. Sounds like a, a movie or a fairy tale more than it does real life, right? Because even getting married to someone, right, when when you do, doesn't mean that everything's going to go great once you're married. So now should you think about everything that could go wrong? I've used the example on here before. I'll use it again. I got married. We thought everything was going to go well. Then she got sick and died. Should I have not gotten married? Should I have thought about that? Should I have obsessed about Oh, but what if we get married and then she dies? Oh, maybe I shouldn't get married. So, Tadman, would you suggest that my marriage was the wrong decision? I should not have ever done that because she died. Or would you say, oh, no, no, no. For you, I mean, it's, you know, as, as people with OCD will do. And, but, but for me though, I'm, I mean, it's different. It's, it's a whole different thing. Uh, uh, you don't understand. And, and this is, this is this way for me and, and it's fine for everybody else and everyone else can, but what if, and what if, and what if, and what if, and I think that probably sounds very familiar for a lot of you who are listening here that those, backtracks and backpedalings and things that that i just did there are things that everyone with ocd does and says well i would i would never apply this to anyone else but but for me it it's it's very real and makes a lot of sense and and all of those types of things so Bastion says, lately I deliberately bring up the thoughts that you thought were completely intrusive and involuntary on purpose. I don't know why I do this, but I end up feeling really bad and totally confused. Well, you know, one of the things that we see is that you might still be checking to see if um, you still believe that they're they're really, really potentially bad or awful or horrible types of thoughts like you used to. Because OCD will say to you, of course, now that you're used to those thoughts and you're not disgusted by them anymore, does that mean that you really like them now or that you want them or that you're okay with them? So this could be a test to still see if you feel bad about them. And, and you do feel really bad about them. You state that right there. And so then that is a little nugget to your OCD and go, okay, good. I still feel bad about those things. All right, great. Uh, we'll revisit again later. And that's what people do, right? So that could be why that's happening. Amber says, hello, Captain Cass. Welcome back. Uh, let's see. You got into an accepted study abroad program in the middle of the rainforest you're super excited and horrified but hey that's life congratulations that's awesome um good job i hope that that works out for you uh we'll miss you of course on on the uh, webinar if that's the case but uh we're glad glad that that will will be awesome adam says where to find energy to do erp every day Sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's hard, but sometimes it's impossible. And the last one matters the most. I would contend that the last one is also the one that OCD wants you to believe as truth, even though 
that is not actually the case. Because if it is impossible, as you state, to do ERP, then there's no help. Now, I've given lots of lectures in my day, and I will go into one a little bit here that I do where I talk about the difference between can't and won't. I'm going to take it outside of OCD for a minute. I had someone come into my office one time who said to me, Dr. McGrath, I can't get on elevators. And I said, okay, um, tell me about that. What's going on? And they proceeded to tell me about their fear of elevators. And they one time heard about someone who got stuck on an elevator and how awful it would be if that were to happen to them as well, too. And they just couldn't bear the idea of it ever occurring. And so now they won't take elevators, but they, they're they interviewing for some jobs coming up and, and those jobs are in some high rises. And they didn't know if they could you know walk up the 40 flights of stairs that they needed to in order to get to the build the, the, the office and that they wanted some help. And I said, all right, well, why don't you come with me? And, and here's what I want you to do. I want you to recognize something. As we're walking out the door, I want you to realize that we're walking through a doorway. And they said, uh, okay. And then as we were walking to the elevator, I said, I want you to recognize that we're walking right now as we're getting to the elevator. And they said, yeah, sure. I, I, I get you. We're, we're walking and, and, uh, and we've, we've walked through a doorway. Okay. So when we got to the elevator, I said, now you've done the two things necessary to be able to get onto an elevator. One is walk for yourself. Um, if, if you were in a wheelchair, roll, right? Whatever it would have been. And um, the second thing would be you went in and out of a doorway. And, and if you were getting onto an elevator for yourself, it would be walking and walking through like the square area of the doorway there to get onto the elevator. So you've done both of those things. And they acknowledge, yes, I've I've absolutely done both of those things. I can do those things. Great. Wonderful. That's awesome. So then uh, I hit the button and the elevator door opened. And I said, okay, now what I want you to do is I want you to walk toward the elevator so that I can watch you bounce off the invisible force field that appears in front of the elevator. And they looked at me and said, what are you, what are you talking about? An invisible force field. I said, well... We've proven that you know how to do everything necessary to get onto an elevator and that you actually can do those things, right? You did walk in and out of my office, which is through a doorway, and you did walk. So we've proven that you can do both of the things necessary in order to get onto an elevator. So the only reason why you can't get onto an elevator, in my logic, as I'm looking at this, must be that there's an invisible force field that is preventing you from doing so. And I therefore would like to watch you bounce off of it because I think that that would be fascinating to see because I've never seen anybody encounter invisible force fields before, but that must be the only reason why you can't get on an elevator. So go ahead. And then they look at me and go, I hate you. And then they say, fine, I, I can get on the elevator, but I don't want to because I'm so afraid of it. And I tell them, oh, well, that's fine. Then I can help you with that. It turns out I'm very, very good at helping people do things that they won't do because they are afraid of doing them. But I am really horrible at helping people do things that they can't do. I have no idea in the world about how to help anyone do anything that they can't do. And I'm going to put the word impossible into that can't phrase. So if you can't do it and it is impossible, I'm useless to you absolutely useless to you, right? There's there's nothing that I or anyone else will be able to do for you if that's the case. But if you won't do it because this thing is really, really frightening to you, and that's why it feels impossible because of all the fear that you have, it's my job to help break that thing down into little component parts and get you to do all of those. And after you've done those things, now we start building them together until you get to the point that you're doing all of them. And then I can be helpful. I can help you with that. I want all of you to pay attention to the messages that you're sending to yourself. And are you telling yourselves that there are things that you can't do? And are you telling yourselves that things are impossible? And if that is the case, you're going to be stuck. Okay. 
We've gotten through half an hour tonight. Uh, thank you for listening to the Wednesday night Net webinar brought to you by No CD. No CD, a downloadable app you can get through Google Play or iOS. Please check us out. And if you're looking for help with obsessive compulsive disorder or if you're looking for help with things like, well, you know, trichotillomania, excoriation, tics, or hoarding along with OCD, we can, we can help you with that. And if you happen to be located in all 50 of the United States and you want to use your insurance, we're getting more and more insurance companies to cover us all the time, but we do cash pay as well. And, and hey, maybe you're in Canada or the United Kingdom or Australia and you're needing some help. Well, we can help you there too. So check us out at nocd.com or download that NoCD app again at Google Play or iOS and click that therapist button. And uh, that'll get you uh, to our care team and we'll be able to set up an appointment with you to see how someone here at NoCD might be able to be helpful to you. So Vegan Knowledge JJ, again, welcome for the first time. Zilia says, I think I have ADD, ADHD. You wanted to tackle your OCD first. Do you think this is a good idea or should I get an ADD treatment right away? You know, I think that that's really going to depend on an assessment that you're going to do with a professional. So it's hard to say without knowing exactly the level of interferences that either of those things have on in your life. So I would really recommend that you go and you meet with someone who can assist you with that. Hollow says, any suggestions if you cannot afford therapy? Thank you. Uh, one, of the, one of the things, just so you know, is we do have a payment plan also here at NoCD. So if you're looking for that, we can work on that if, if that helps at all. But there are um, things like these lectures and the NoCD app even has therapy tools on it that you can work on designing some things for yourself and building some exposures for yourself as well too. And there's a great self-help uh, world out there. Uh, I wrote a book called The OCD Answer Book. If that's helpful at all, it's got a bunch of things in it. You can also look at the International OCD Foundation, iocdf.org, and they have a lot of great information about OCD and treatment and help as well, too. So you may want to check that out of ways to get some help and some good readings about OCD. And uh, you can even look at old new OCD Foundation newsletters. They have lots of great information in there as well, too. Uh, let's see. How do you distinguish instinct intuition from OCD? It's hard to know which parts of myself to trust. You know, I think OCD puts doubts into all of these things and gets you to wonder which is which and what is what and those types of things. Uh, I don't know how much I, you know, want to say intuition, you know, it almost has kind of this mystical, magical kind of component to it or something of that nature. Um, instinct, you know, are we talking more of a primal kind of thing built in or, or is that kind of you're, you're talking about it from an intuition point of view as well too? You know, we, we even hear phrases like trust your gut or things of that nature, but even the gut can be fooled because you can read something as fearful into something that everybody else is really enjoying and having a great time with. So when presented with a roller coaster, uh, nine out of 10 people may be like, woohoo. And one is like, oh my God, my stomach hurts so bad. There's no way that I can get on this roller coaster. It's awful. It's horrible. Right. So, um, just because you have a feeling about something or an intuition or an instinct about something, does not make it necessarily true or real. And when OCD is in the mix, I think that that's when you really want to work with someone, a therapist who's going to help you work on developing ERP skills so that you can go out and live the life that you want to live and not the life that your OCD wants you to live. So give that a try and, and see how that goes. Mike says, I'm having a really difficult time with your uh, pedophilic OCD. Stumbled onto a video about... Uh, I don't know what that means, MAPs, uh, MAPs. And it just puts you into a spiral going through the it's not OCD, you're terrible, et cetera. Any advice? Um, you know, Mike, you're always going to find something that's going to throw doubt into you, right? The, the issue, of course, with doing any kind of research on anything in OCD is you're always going to find at least one person that says, yeah, I think you're probably wrong in there. And I think it's actually this. And, and I think all of you who have OCD will notice this. You believe the naysayers more than the experts. And you elevate naysayers into expert status. 
and you take experts and you you cut them down a couple of notches. I mean, I know the experts all said this, but but this one person in this one post 17 years ago that I found said this. And what if they're actually right? I mean, they said that's how it was for them. So what if it really was? And what if that means that it's going to be that way for me too? And what if all the experts are wrong about this? And this is the only person who's this has really ever happened to and knows my truth. And I really should reach out to them and contact them and talk to them and see what happened and how did it go and all these kinds of things. And, and so when you have a disorder that makes everyone an expert who agrees with the doubts that the disorder has, uh, what it does is it, it, it takes away the ability of the actual experts to really be helpful to you because now you stop believing in anything that the actual experts are talking about. And you're believing all of these fringe kinds of things and thinking, yeah, no, but I mean, why would they have said it if it wasn't true? You got 45 other experts over here telling you that's not the way that it works. And you got this one person saying, I don't believe any of you. I think it's this way. And you've decided, oh yeah, that's the person that's right. I'm going to, I'm going to go with them. Yeah. That, that sounds really, really true and logical. And like a lot of attention really needs to be paid to that. And it's crap, of course, right? It's it's utter bull that, that we do that, but that's what OCD does. OCD does not care about information that goes counter to it. It demands it and it wants it, but it never believes it, but it still demands it and wants it. What does OCD love? Confirmatory information. Anything that agrees with what OCD says. And then it says, aha, the jackpot. We have found it. There it is. I knew it was out there. I knew that if I searched long enough and look at this, after 14 years of being online every day of my life for at least seven hours, I have finally found something that confirms that, yes, there's another person who agrees with me out there. Sure, they died 55 years ago, but they wrote it in a book and it was scanned and published. And now I've read it and I knew it. I knew it. And everyone else, ha ha, take that. You all thought I was crazy and nuts for looking at these things for so long. Well, guess what? I'm not. I finally found the proof that I've been looking for. Or just because one person says something, well, do we have to go with it and believe it's true? I don't think so. So that's what I would take a look at there, uh, uh, Michelle. Is just um, recognize that that you don't you don't have to you don't have to believe everything that pops into your head, and you may tell yourself you're terrible and awful and all these things, and you may even tell yourself it's not OCD, but just because we tell ourselves those things doesn't make them true. Alok says, I have religious OCD, so some scrupulosity, it sounds like, which makes me pray many times throughout the day out of fear. You've tried ERP, but many times you just can't resist. Any tips? Alok, one of the things that I would want you to realize is those prayers aren't actually prayers. Those prayers are compulsions. Okay? So... You're not actually praying in those situations. You're doing compulsions because those prayers are being done in order to relieve whatever obsession has popped into your head. And your compulsion is taken on uh, doing a prayer as the way to deal with that obsession. A prayer is done to commune with a higher power. And if you choose to do that, you do that as a form of communication with some higher power. A compulsion is done to alleviate an intrusive thought or image or urge. So I think you're seeing there, lock. those prayers, again, aren't actually prayers. They are compulsions. Now, you've probably been stuck in a belief that they are prayers and they are helpful and you need to do them. But I'm telling you right now, they aren't prayers. You have not been praying. You have been compulsing, right? So... If saying more prayers was going to get you out of OCD, then you know what I would tell you to do? I would say spend the, spend the rest of your life praying and then you will be cured of obsessive compulsive disorder. 
But Alak, I, I, I will make you this promise. I guarantee you this. I don't say those words very often. Your, your higher power themselves could show up in front of you and say, hey, uh, no worries. You're all good. You're getting into the afterlife you want. Everything's fine. And you know what your first response to them would be? Are you sure? You know why? Because you have OCD. And OCD is the doubting disorder. And there's nothing that you can tell someone with OCD that they won't doubt. So maybe uh, you're not resisting because you've thought of these things as prayers. But I want you to recognize you can pray. And that's fine. If you want to pray in the morning when you wake up and, and commune with your higher power for a couple of minutes, go ahead. And you want to do that again at night. But anything else in the day, I'm going to bet is probably a ritual and does not need to occur. So think about that. <laughs> Maria says, how do you deal with self-harm OCD or suicidal OCD? Well, what we want people to do is we want them to recognize that, yes, you can have absolutely intrusive thoughts about what if you were to harm yourself and or or kill yourself? And I would want to take a look at the compulsions that people are doing that they believe are the things that are keeping themselves safe. And I would want to work on eliminating those compulsions to show them that they would be absolutely fine without doing all of those compulsions. Those compulsions are not doing anything to keep them alive whatsoever. Those compulsions are being done to alleviate the fear they have of what if they were to do something that would be harmful to themselves, right? Remember, OCD is a what if problem. What if I were to harm myself? What if I were to kill myself? What if I were to molest someone? What if I were to run someone over with my car? It's all of these what if kinds of experiences. What if I offended a higher power, right? I don't, I don't treat people who've done things. I treat people who are afraid of what if they were to do things. They spend their entire lives in the what if kind of experience. I also treat people who used to do things all the time that now have developed OCD. And now the very things they used to do, they don't do anymore because now they're afraid of them. So I, I, I love that. Uh, I love those discussions with people who I could say, just six months ago, you were doing this thing. And now you're saying you can't do it without all sorts of compulsions or you won't do it without all sorts of compulsions. The reality actually is this. You did that thing for 40 years of your life without a problem. And then something changed in your head, right? And now you view it through an entirely different lens. I don't need to change the thing. I need to change the way you perceive that thing. I need you to develop a better perception around that thing, right? So that's what I want you to do. Hope that helps. Rai says, good afternoon, what are your tips for self-harm intrusive thoughts? Mine are slowly subsiding, but I want to maximize these thoughts as everyday objects strike fear in you. So, Rai, um, you know, similar to what we were saying there, when those self-harm intrusive thoughts come into your head, I want you to allow them to be there. And I want you then to go do whatever it is that you were going to do. I want you to live your life. There's a difference between distraction and living our lives. So if those thoughts pop into your head and you're on your way to work, you might turn the radio up really loud and sing the song and other things to try to distract yourself from it. You might turn around and drive back home and say, I can only get to work if I have a good ride without having any of these thoughts. Or you could drive and still those thoughts be there and go to work and those thoughts be there and do your job with those thoughts being there and watch them over the course of the day fade away without having to do anything to make them go away, they just start to fade away on their own. We don't have to make things go away. We really don't. They can go away on their own. We just have to allow them the time to be able to do such a thing. That's what's really, really important. Victor asks, the connection between OCD and borderline personality disorder rumination and treatment. Uh, I'll go on the treatment piece a little bit first. I'm not as familiar uh, on, on the connection between the two, I will admit. So uh, I might have to hold that question and bring someone else in. Uh, but in terms of treatment, there's 
dialectical behavior therapy, which is very good for borderline personality disorder. And then there's ERP, which we're using for obsessive compulsive disorder. So let me see if I can find someone that I can bring in who's got some really good BPD, borderline personality disorder information, and could really talk better about those things than I could. Uh, I know what I'm good at and I know what I know a little bit about, but could be dangerous and want to make sure that I don't give all uh, potentially incorrect information away. So, uh, Victor, remind me of that one. Uh, and and um, I'm going to, in fact, I'm going to write that one down, get out my handy little notebook here, and uh, let me see if I can bring someone on that helps with that. All righty. Thank you. Bendy says, are compulsions only for obsessions? Can I have compulsions for other things? If so, how do I find out what they are? In the definition that we use in the uh, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, compulsions are only to neutralize obsessions. Now, there are things that we use in day-to-day -day language that talk about compulsions, like compulsive gambling and, and, and uh, other things of that nature, but I don't use that term for anything other than obsessive compulsive disorder and compulsions are done to neutralize obsessions. Okay. Puddin Cake says, how can one work with health OCD after being diagnosed with something scary? Hint, it's me. I started developing uh, trigeminal neuralgia and have health anxiety before this. It's a rough diagnosis. Boo. Well, First of all, poopies on that, I say boo as well. So I agree with you, Putin cake. Um, but here's the deal. Go with the experts, right? Trust in them. Follow their advice. Because what I don't want you to do, Putin cakes, is to go down the rabbit hole of research and finding all sorts of things that are going to be frightening and scary to you and lead you to want to do more and more research because now you're more frightened and more scared and you're gonna keep on this endless loop of information and go down rabbit holes that you do not want to go down and that will not be helpful to you in any way whatsoever. So that would be my plea to you, Puddin' Cakes, is to not do that and to go along with what the experts tell you and follow their advice and do that. And, and I think that that would be the most helpful thing to you. Now, you are going to have intrusive thoughts about all of this. You're going to be bugged by it. You're going to have an urge to do research and to check things, right? You may even have an urge to check the nerves and everything and touch and, and what's going on there. And is it working as well now as it was just 20 seconds ago? And, and you might even notice that you do certain repetitive behaviors or things as checks. Those are the things you got to catch yourself doing and not do those. Again, you're going to go with the things the experts tell you to do. If OCD was an expert at helping people, we would prescribe OCD to everyone. We would say, hmm, let's see. Well, um, I notice, I'm going to use MS. I have a lot of MS in my family. I notice that you've got MS. Um, may I suggest as a helpful tool for this that you also develop some obsessive compulsive disorder so that you can research everything about MS, find all the bad things that could happen and worry about how it might affect you in some way. But no, that would be horrible. I would never go to any of my family members with MS and tell them, hey, got something helpful for you. It's called obsessive compulsive disorder. Just totally get it. Never, ever would I do such a thing whatsoever for anybody. It seems ridiculous just to even say it out loud, of course, right? But OCD wants to insert itself in and say, ooh, be me, pick me, pick me. I can be really helpful here. Over here. Yeah, yeah. Over here. I got I got answers. I got answers. I can I, I can help you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Right, me, right here. Yeah, yeah. No. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> no. Horrible, awful advice. OCD's advice is crap. Nothing that we would want to follow whatsoever. Greg says, first time here and you have your first uh, appointment with no CD therapist on the 25th. Awesome. Welcome, Greg. Glad to have you. Uh, Eternity says, can repetitive behaviors cause schizophrenia? 
Uh, very simple uh, answer to that is no. Otherwise, everyone who worked in a factory on an assembly line would have schizophrenia because they do repetitive behaviors all day long. They constantly put in windows in a car or or lift this, this uh, machine up and then put a thing of cardboard in it and then pull the machine back down and then lift it up again and pull the cardboard back out so they can make a box of it. And they do that eight hours a day, 40 hours a week that would then mean that they would develop schizophrenia because that would be a repetitive behavior. So I think we can very much state that doing a repetitive behavior does not cause schizophrenia or everyone on assembly lines would have schizophrenia if that were the case. Chelsea says, today I did an exposure and you felt great. Now the doubt is there. Well, of course, because you have obsessive compulsive disorder, I'm going to assume. So why wouldn't there be? And you know, it won't go away, but it's so hard to sit in it again. Yeah, it will. Over time, it will fade to the point that you just won't even notice it or care about it. I, I want OCD to become like the ticking clock in your house. And when you get that really loud ticking clock and it enters your home and it's going tick, You're like, damn, that's a loud clock. Why did I buy that clock? But over the course of a couple of weeks, you just kind of are in the house and the clock's going, but you're doing your thing and everything like that. You're not really noticing. You're paying attention. You're like, da da da, boo da, boo, ba, ba, boo, boo, cooking dinner, watch television, going to bed, oh, vacuuming, all these great things. And, and then bing bong, someone comes over to your house and goes, man, that's a loud clock. And you suddenly hear tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. Well, you're always hearing the clock. You weren't necessarily paying attention to it, but you were always hearing it. And so what if you could get your entire life to be that way? What if you can get your entire life that even though OCD is playing in the background, you know, having a concert, whatever it's doing, you were like, eh, eh, just whatever, background noise, stupid, not paying attention, not listening, don't care. It's just dumb. And you went on with everything, right? Um, someone's asking about uh, CapCast. What are my thoughts about ICBT? Uh, honestly, I know nothing about it whatsoever. I was just offered uh, to watch some things about it. So I'm going to check those things out because... I, I like to be informed on that kind of stuff. So uh, that's that's all I could say. I, I I know absolutely nothing about it whatsoever. So I'll I'll, uh, I'll take a look at it and uh, you know can can chat about that later. Shepard says, "Do you start playing out your obsessions? If I think you're possessed, will you act out?" Well, let's let's see it. Let's 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 take it. Um, I'm going to think really hard. I'm going to throw my phone at the camera. All right. I'm totally throwing my phone at the camera now. I'm absolutely going to throw I'm going to play it out. I'm going to play it. I'm going to throw it. I'm going to throw it. I'm going to throw it. I'm throwing it. Playing it out. 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 Playing, play, 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 playing it out. Nope. I guess I don't throw things at the camera, even though I'm playing it out and I'm thinking it. So the answer is no. Just because uh things are going through your head like this doesn't mean that you're going to do something or that you need to worry about it or spend so much time with that as well too, right? It's just, it's just not necessary. Um, but OCD loves to say, ah, but what if, what if I think, uh, uh, you know, about it and what if I play it out and, and all of these things, what if I act out on it? You know, that would be, that'd be really bad. What if I act out on it? I, I thinking it might make it true. But um, I thought for years the ceiling's going to collapse on me. And anybody who's ever been treated by me knows that I've used that example now for 23 years. I've been thinking about ceilings collapsing on me for 23 years. Guess what's never once happened? To me? A ceiling collapsing on me. But I'm still thinking about it. Could happen. It is, it is a possibility, right? Or as someone I know likes to say, a possibility uh, for those of you who who love the flying spaghetti monster. All right. Um, I, Katerina, why does sexual orientation OCD feel like denial or repression? You know, we kind of, we kind of went through that a little bit already uh, at the beginning of, of the hour. So I think that if you go back and, and watch this, you'll, you'll see a lot of things there, but um, 
of course, OCD wants you to investigate things and we want you to live with doubt and uncertainty about things. And then OCD will say, oh, well, then you're just in denial, right? That's just repressing. But actually, it's just about letting obsessions be there and and not being ruled by them or, or letting them take over your entire life and tell you what to do. Holly says, I struggle with medical fears as an obsession. I always feel like I don't know when to pay attention or when you're doubting or what ifing. Such serious risk, it seems. Um, you know, Holly, I, I tell people, yeah, it's great to go to the doctor when you need to go to the doctor. And it's not great to go to the doctor when your OCD says you need to go to the doctor, right? So uh, get your physicals and uh, follow the advice of your physicians and, you know, if suddenly you're profusely bleeding all over the place or doubled over in pain or something of those natures, probably great times to go visit your doctor. But also have that conversation with your doctor. Say, hey, doc, guess what? I've got health anxiety. I do a lot of research on things. I'm prone to call you a lot. And I'm just wondering, what are the parameters that you think are best for me? Have that, that kind of conversation with your healthcare provider as well, too. Nothing wrong at all with with doing that. Question, can OCD play into social anxiety? Well, I see a lot of people with obsessive compulsive disorder who are very embarrassed about their OCD, who don't want anyone to see them doing compulsions. Uh, children who may go through an entire day of school without doing any kind of compulsion whatsoever and then come home and be filled with compulsions when they get home. Why? If I did the compulsions at school and the kids saw me, they might tease me or make fun of me or think that I'm weird and I wouldn't want that. But my family, well, they have to love me. They have to like me. So it's okay to do these things around my family because they have to like me. But I don't want to do them around my friends because they could judge or evaluate me. So yeah, you could see a lot of those interactions happening as well. Alice says, how to support a partner who has OCD, both specifically with his relationship OCD and with other OCD subtypes. Alice, Alice, the biggest thing that I tell families when I'm working with them is that you want to make sure that you're not giving in to safety behaviors. Alice, the we're coming to the end here, but one quick piece of advice I can give you. If you're asked a question more than once, Alice, what I want you to do is I want you to get a notebook out. I want you to put that notebook on the dining room table. And if you're asked a question more than once, I want you to take that question. I want you to write it down. I want you to write your answer down. And then, Alice, if you're ever asked that question again, all you are to say is, oh, that's in the notebook. Now, the person with OCD, your, your partner, is not going to like that, right? They're going to want you to answer that question again. They're going to want to get into another conversation. Your job, Alice, is to not do that because that just feeds the obsessive compulsive disorder. It doesn't actually help anything or make anything better. I want you to not do that. I want you to feed into the non-safety behaviors. So the notebook is great because you might say, well, but wouldn't the notebook re reassurance thing go back to the notebook? They memorize the notebook really quick. They don't need the notebook anymore. They want you to engage in this. And Alice, don't engage. And that's the best thing that I can tell you. Uh, and, and I hope that that helps. Hey, everyone, you've listened once again to another hour of the No CD Wednesday night webinar with me, Patrick McGrath. I am a clinical psychologist and the chief clinical officer of No CD. As always, it is a joy to be here with all of you, and I hope that you have found this to be a very, very helpful night. Uh, I, I got to tell you, I really enjoy doing this webinar on a weekly basis, and I hope that you also enjoy it as well, too. And remember, no CD helps those with obsessive compulsive disorder, tics, body focused repetitive behaviors, hoarding. And we've got our no CD 411 sessions as well, too, if you're looking for info about OCD. Reach out to us at nocd.com or download our app. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you again in a week. Be well.
Shine it so bright. 